Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again. It's been a while since I've had the opportunity to do one of these growth path challenges, so I thought I would crank it up again. We've had a lot of great seminars going on with the foundation, and many of them have been placed on the foundation's Facebook page. So I hope you go and watch some of those great seminars as well. We don't have much going on today, so it's time for growth path challenge number 77. You ready to go? Okay, slide number one is tissue from a dog. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. Now, I've always said, if you open up the chest of a dog and it looks like somebody's poured a can of spaghetti sauce in it, I want you to think about actinomyces or nocardia. Now, this is a very interesting histologic appearance because a lot of people get tricked into diagnosing a mesothelioma because you have this florid mesothelial proliferation. But on top of that, you have fibrinoseppurative pleuritis, which you generally don't with mesothelioma. So the morphologic diagnosis for this slide is going to be a diffuse proliferative and fibrinoseppurative pleuritis. Histologically, if you look at these, sometimes you will find these mats of filamentous bacteria surrounded by neutrophils, which we call sulfur granules. But you only see that with actinomyces. You don't see that with nocardia. The agent name is generally actinomyces viscosus or nocardia asteroides. If you want to remember which ones have sulfur granules and which ones don't, okay, no sulfur granules for no cardia. That's how I remember. Um, occasionally you'll see, or very rarely you'll see, bacillus nodosus as a causative agent here, but I would go with one of the higher bacteria, such as actinomyces or no cardia. How do dogs usually get this? Well, it's often due to a penetrating wound, often a grass or foxtail on, which goes in through the skin and can migrate through the skin, through the muscle. It just keeps on going through the lung up until it embeds itself into a rib, it embeds itself into a uh, vertebral body, the, the bottom of the vertebra, and so it stays there and it's brought that infectious agent with them. You can also see this type of infection in the abdomen as well. Okay, that's a fantastic picture of this. Slide number two is tissue from a calf. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis? And three possible causes. Okay, time's up. There's some funky stuff going on here. But the most important thing that you can see right here is that the cerebrum is collapsed on itself. There's very little left of the cerebral cortex. There's actually an outpouching here, which looks like it contains the meninges. And I'm not sure what's going on here with the fact that the uh, tongue looks sort of floppy. I don't know if uh, we just didn't cut the, uh, the jaw very well, but we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so there's actually three morphologic diagnoses. First one that I would like is hydranencephaly, okay? Hydranencephaly is usually the result of infection with a number of viruses during the period where the brain is developing in utero. And if you hit that particular window, which is often 75 to 125 days or somewhere in there, you're going to have viral infection of the periventricular germal cells, which give rise to the cerebrum. They will be killed off and the cerebrum will not develop, or only a little bit will develop. And what you have inside here is largely just the meninges. There is also a opening in the top of the skull with meninges coming through, which is a meningo seal. You obviously have to have a defect in the skull for this to protrude. Remember we said a lot of times that the nervous system drives the development of the, of the overlying bone. So if the brain is not developing, you may have some defects in cranial development. So we have hydranencephaly, meningocele, 
And then I'm not sure what's going on here. I think that this maxilla was cut badly, but the other thing that I want you to know is that with a lot of these viruses, you will see some significant craniofacial abnormalities, such as brachynathia inferior, which is a shortened mandible, or you may have arthrogryposis because the spinal cord's affected, the muscles are not innervated properly during development, so they don't develop well and everything's sort of drawn up. A lot of these viruses have uh, significant skeletal abnormalities as well. So I asked you for three causes, and there are a bunch of different viruses that cause this. Um, one that has received a lot of uh, attention in Europe over the last decade is Schmallenberg virus, and some great pictures um, and articles on Schmallenberg virus in the last couple of years of vet path. Okay, in the U.S., we have cash. Valley virus, um, which is an Orbi virus. Uh, in Japan, there's Akabani or Aino virus, both Orbi viruses. Um, and then a, another disease which popped up in Europe, which caused hydranencephaly in calves, is ovine Orbi virus or blue tongue virus serotype A. I was thought that was going to be a huge problem in Europe, but it was contained very well and never really became a, a massive disaster like it might have. And that is one that uh, cause a typical blue tongue in sheep, but in calves would cause this type of devastating uh, cerebral lesion. Okay, fantastic. Just remember, hydranencephaly, you want to think of uh, Orbi viruses first and foremost. Slide number three is tissue for, <laughs> from a dog. Can you give me the morphologic diagnosis for this lesion and name two other potential concurrent lesions in this animal? <coughs> okay, time's up. We're looking at probably a German Shepherd or a German Shepherd mix, and you can see these large nodules. Some are alopecic, some are not on the feet, and here on the legs. And these are cutaneous dermatofibromas. Some people call this nodular dermatofibrosis. This has been known since the 70s. It's a triad of lesions. Um, the other lesions that you may see are renal cyst adenoma. And if the dog is female, you may see uterine fibroliomyomas. Okay, of course, you're not going to see that in male dogs. But uh, those are the classic triad of lesions. And when you look at these histologically, they just look like bland areas of nodular dermal fibrosis, which we see a lot in any surgical biopsy practice as a result of low-grade trauma. But the fact that this animal has multiple ones on its legs should make you think of this classic triad. We'll see a number of these in the military working dogs over the years that have renal cystadenomas or renal cystadenocarcinoma. Okay, this is slide number four, and is tissue from a cinemologous macaque. Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. I like this picture. When I first looked at it, I said, oh, maybe it's a, a, a possum. But it turns out this one is a cino. And so you have to sort of shuffle your diagnosis. Um, and we're looking at multiple renal abscesses, or if you want to call this, I like the term suppurative embolic nephritis. This makes me sound really smart. Um, suppurative, same thing as abscesses. Embolic means that it comes through the blood vessels. And nephritis, of course, is kidney. Multifocal suppurative embolic nephritis. And the cause of this, it could be a number of things, but one of the things that we see that does this is Yersinia pseudotuberculosis or enterocolitica. And those are the two that you're going to see large colonies in the middle of this area of pus and necrosis, large colonies of bacteria. You can't really tell the two apart, you need that PCR, but um, in non human primates, Yersinia can be a real problem, especially in animals that are kept in zoos 
where uh, rodents can get into the uh, into the enclosure. So I'm thinking roadside zoos because one thing about monkeys, especially this is a huge thing in uh, in squirrel monkeys because if a rodent comes by, you know we don't think of uh, of not even primates as being carnivores, but anything that can go in the mouth of a non-human primate will go in the mouth and they will eat, uh, they will kill and eat uh, rodents, they will eat beetles, they will eat whatever. And rodents fairly commonly will carry Yersinia. Um, and this is how you see that. It's a fairly common cause of death in animals in roadside zoos. So if you are dealing with a small zoo and they have open cages or something like that, um, be aware of your cinea. You're probably going to see it eventually. Slide number five is a great picture from Dr. Donald O'Toole, and this is tissue from a dog. And can you name the condition? Okay, time's up. Well, these nails have seen better days. They are brittle. They are breaking off. This one looks like it is totally gone. This is a condition that uh, the cause is not really known. It's known, uh, it goes by the name of lupoid onychodystrophy. And uh, whether it's connected to uh, the classical forms of uh, lupus, whether it's systemic or, or uh, cutaneous is anybody's guess. Histologically, you will see a interface dermatitis um, at the level of the uh, nail bed epithelium and the problem is over the years I get a number of cases of this and and the nail breaks off or falls off and the vet will drop it in formalin and send it to you and it's totally useless it's just a typical claw unless they give you the nail bed epithelium it's usually not attached to it unless they amputate a toe or they really have a good suspicion and they biopsy some of that nail bed epithelium, um, you can't give them a diagnosis. You can say, I think it might be this, especially if they give you a nice gross picture like this, but uh, um, it's a difficult diagnosis in practice. Um, so, lupoid onychodystrophy. Slide number six is also tissue from a dog. Can you give me two morphologic diagnoses? A great picture. I think this is from Dr. Oscar Caseta at uh, University of Las Palmas in Canary Islands. And I've given you enough time. The first morphologic diagnosis is megasophagus. The second diagnosis was along with the megasophagus, and this is a diffuse necrotizing or necrosuppurative bronchial pneumonia. And this is the result of aspiration pneumonia. Um, this dilated esophagus is probably full of food. The animal aspirated some uh, into its lungs. Let's talk for a moment about uh, uh, megasophagus because it's a lot more interesting than aspiration pneumonia. There are two forms of megasophagus. There are the congenital forms, which is the result of a uh, vascular ring anomaly um, and or a persistent right aortic arch. And you can tell that easily because before the heart base, everything is dilated. After the heart base, it's not dilated. When the entire esophagus over the heart base all the way down into the stomach is dilated, then you're probably dealing with one of the acquired forms. And acquired megasophagus is a difficult diagnosis for the surgical pathologist because believe it or not, the muscle layer doesn't look all that different. Um, and unless you're, you get a nice picture like this, it can be sort of tough. Things that make it easier is if you have inflammation in the wall, if you have mucosal ulceration, and especially if you have fungal infection of that mucosa, which is a dead giveaway you're dealing with megasophagus. But I've been surprised a number of times when I would look at the esophagus, I'd look at the muscle wall and say, it's gotta be really thin and you just really can't tell the difference. Maybe if you had a nice control next to it. But uh, so, and the causes of uh, acquired megasophagus are legendary and many are idiopathic. There are a number of toxins like lead that will do it. Uh, it can be 
uh, secondary to myasthenia gravis, it can be uh, a, one of the causes can be poly idiopathic polymyositis. It could be part of a constellation of uh, muscle injury in a number of different organs. Um, so, but most of them are just idiopathic. You never can really figure it out. So, megasophagus, necrotizing bronchopneumonia, great care. Okay, this is tissue from a horse. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and I'm gonna take two causes. Taking two causes because we're a little far away. Okay, time's up. We're looking at the colon of a horse. Okay, and this colon looks very edematous. Okay, there are little reddish areas scattered through here. So I'm gonna call this a diffuse fibrinonecrotic colitis with edema. Now you could have gone a lot of ways on this colon. Now, first thing that I, I say over and over again is that salmonella is a great imposter in the horse and anything can look like salmonella. And if you have a lesion or even the absence of lesion in the intestine and the colon, I still want to think about salmonella. So if you said salmonella type murray, I think you're great. Okay, always include that in your differential diagnosis. Okay, the little red dittas that you are seeing Whereas you could have said they are ulcers, they're actually small granulomas containing small strongyles or cyapostomes. Okay, so that's another cause, and you see those in the colon. If you look, we got a little closer, you would see little red granulomas. These containing a single third or fourth stage cyapostome larva, and the problem is they tend to all pop out at the same time, causing the animal significant colonic injury. They're in this hypobiotic stage, and now they all come out at the same time. I have no idea why they do that, why, how they know that for their life cycle, the environmental conditions outside this animal is going to be, uh, going to be good to continue their life cycle, but that's what they do. They go into hypobiosis, and they all pop out at the same time. A couple of other possibilities. Um, I would consider uh, the possibility of neorist neo rickettsia or stickii or potomac horse fever is generally a colonic infection. The bacteria are primarily within macrophages, but occasionally we'll get into the colonic epithelium itself. It has one of the uh, greatest names um, besides potomac horse fever. Um, it also goes by the name Shasta River Crud. I love that. Shasta River Crud for the win. Um, and those would be three really good ones. I don't see a lot of ulceration, so I'm not thinking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, but those would be three good, really good ones for like a, a very edematous colon with some reddish possibilities. I think if we got a little closer, you'd be able to pick out the cyathostomes. Hey, we're running short on questions on this one. This is slide number eight, and it's tissue from a fish. And can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause? Okay, time's up. The morphologic diagnosis is focally extensive necrotizing dermatitis right here with fungal invasion. What came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, but I know that the ulceration came first in this particular fish. Um, this agent, which is saprolegnia species, there's a zillion different ones, so we just lump them together in saprolegnia. As saprolegnia is, uh, um, it's an opportunistic invader. It cannot cause necrosis of the skin or the scales or anything like that. So you had something pre-existing. I can't tell you what did this on this fish, whether it got scraped, whether it has some sort of systemic disease, I don't know, but I can tell you that it wasn't caused by the saprolegnia. Saprolegnia pictures, um, generally you see them, if you can see these fungal hyphae floating upwards, these are taken underwater. And so this is a pretty good picture of that. So if you're trying to get a good picture of saprolegnia, you're not gonna be able to do it just with the dead fish because that fungal hyphae is gonna lay flat. It's not really gonna show up very well. So when you try and take a picture of saprolegnia, stick them in a glass of water and you'll get a good picture, a shallow petri dish. Okay, slide number nine is tissue from an adult horse, 20 years old. 
Can you give me a morphologic diagnosis and two possible causes? Okay, time's up. When I go to the trouble to tell you it's an adult horse or it's a foal, please use that information because I'm doing it only for a reason. Otherwise, I would just do it as a horse. What we're looking at is this, this particular liver looks very yellowish green, like you've got cholestasis or something. And what we're seeing here is very close up. You see tremendous fibrosis, and there is biliary proliferation here. I told you it was a 20 year old. I didn't want anyone looking at this and saying, well, that's all necrosis. And if I told you it was a fold, you'd probably go for clustering piliformin, which would be a good one. Um, but it's not a fold, it's an adult horse, a horse that has been grazing uh, toxic plants for a while. And what happens is they get cirrhosis and their livers shrink. This is all, this is what le is left of viable liver, and there's very little. This is all a combination of tremendous fibrosis, bridging portal fibrosis and uh, biliary duplication, biliary hyperplasia, whatever you want to call it, ductal reaction. Those are all good words for it. Okay, and this is an animal that's been grazing toxic plants. If you told me that this was pyrolyzine, alkaloid toxicity, or aflatoxin, I'm good with those two. If you want to go down the road of, I'm just going to give you a couple of, of uh, uh, two different plants that contain pyrolizine alkaloids. There are so many plants out there that you can pick. Corollaria, Senecio, two that you get very commonly, but there's all sorts of them out there. So I would take either two plants contain pyrolizine alkaloid or uh, pyrolizine alkaloid and aflatoxin. Both of those cause a DNA adducts. Um, the, you have damage, you have the potential, at least with aflatoxin, for development of neoplasia with pyrolizidine alkaloid. Um, you don't have the ability for these cells to divide. They get these huge nuclei, uh, which we call megalocytosis. But this is a great, the liver looks sort of greenish because there's tremendous cholestasis. In certain species like horses and chickens, when you have cholestasis or other birds, um, you get a very greenish liver. So that's why I told you it's an adult horse. And an old horse on top of it. Um, these are unrewarding cases, as are most cases of cirrhosis in any species, because this is a long-term process. The animal's been eating just enough of a toxic principle that uh, they kill off a little bit of the parasites, not enough to kill the horse outright, and then they replace them with fibrous connective tissue. Uh, in the case of the horse, fibrous connective tissue and big wads of hepatocytes. In the case of dogs and cats and people. Slide number 10, and then we're done for today, is tissue from a cheetah. I feel sorry for cheetahs. Cheetahs that are extremely inbred. They get all these diseases. That's why they say cheetahs never win. And uh, unfortunately, because we have a good look at this one's insides, it doesn't seem to have won either. But uh, can you give me a morphologic diagnosis for this common lesion of cheetahs? You can see it in other cats as well. Okay, time's up. Well, if you know anything about cheetahs, besides the fact that they get a lot of viral infections, they, don't, they are so inbred, they don't have great immune systems. This is something that has nothing to do with that. And we have these whitish areas throughout the spleen. And these are myelolipomas. You can see myelolipomas in cats, you can see them in dogs. They're just a, a sort of nodular proliferation of fat. You don't normally see fat in the spleen. And that fat often contains marrow elements. That is the myelo part. And the lipoma is the fat. And it's a cheetah thing, but you can see it in other species as well. Does this animal have pancreatitis? Look how red that pancreas is. No, it doesn't. That's the way the pancreas normally looks at autopsy. It has this reddish color. So don't call something pancreatitis. Um, if this was a real case of pancreatitis, it would be very knobby, very nodular. Remember cats, even big cats, um, they get a nodular type of pancreatitis. It's usually white. It's chronic. It's white. It's very knobby. This is probably a fairly normal pancreas in this animal. And that brings us to the absolute end of Gross Path Challenge number 77. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be back tomorrow with Gross Path Challenge number 78. Don't think we have any lectures scheduled for the foundation. Hey, make sure that you come to this week's uh, free Friday seminar. You can go to the Foundation's Facebook page 
and you can click and get and register for that. There's no charge for that. It's going to be a great one. It is with Dr. Leslie Woods, who's an old friend of mine from University of California, Davis. And we taught the gross course together a number of times back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And uh, she's going to talk about some of her favorite avian diseases. Um, and then we're also going to have a brief presentation by Dr. Paco Utsal from the San Bernardino branch of the California Animal uh, Health and Food Safety Laboratories. He's going to talk about an ongoing uh, outbreak of Newcastle disease. It's been going on for a couple of years now in California. We'll have an update on that. And I'm sure Dr. Woods is going to talk about Newcastle's disease because I think that's one of everyone's favorite avian diseases. So with that, I hope everybody is safe and healthy and I will see you again.